All right, let me welcome Heath Tarbear and Jay Masari. Caps to start. Yes. Hi, everybody. I'm Zaid Masari. I am currently the CLO and a co founder of a company called Lightspark. We're building payments on the Bitcoin Lightning Network, which I'm sure you guys are all happy to hear. Um, I'm going to be moderating a conversation uh, with my friend Heath. Uh, Heath Tarbert is the Chief Legal Officer and Head of Corporate Affairs at Circle, uh, the leading US stablecoin issuer. Um, Heath has a very long um, and exceptional bio. I won't go through the whole thing today, but prior um, to his work at Circle, um, Heath has held a number of public sector leadership roles um, in the federal government, including as chairman of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Um, he was Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for International Markets and Development and was an Associate White House Counsel. Um, this panel is to talk a little bit about stable coins um, and regulation. Heath and I are both lawyers, um, happy to say, and uh, we have spent an inordinate amount of time, I think, between the two of us working on stable coin uh, Stablecoin regulation, um, for my part, I was outside counsel to the ill-fated uh, Facebook Libra project and its quixotic journey through financial regulation. Um, and I know Heath has spent a lot of time um, in his roles working on a variety of crypto uh, uh, legislative uh, and regulatory and policy matters. Um, so we're just gonna start with some questions. We'll have um, time for audience questions um, at the end of the discussion. Um, though if somebody has a pressing question that they just really are excited to ask um, as part of the conversation, um, please feel free to do that. We can, we can be pretty flexible um, as we start. So Heath, thanks for, for being here. Great, great to be here. We promise we're going to not make this boring, okay? We're going to, you know, but because as the last panel, I think, demonstrated, the legal stuff matters. It matters a lot to this market. Uh, and so we hope to sort of hopefully give you guys some insights as you go off and work on your own projects, your own investments, et cetera. Um, let me just say it's great to be here at MIT. Uh, this, is, this is a very special place, so it's quite, um, you know, it makes a lot of sense to have this conference here where so many innovations have occurred over the last 100 years or more. Um, I also think it's important that we're talking about stable coins at a Bitcoin expo, right? It all started with Bitcoin. We would not be having discussions about digital assets, the transformation of the financial system, Web3, the third generation of the internet, had it not been for that symbol right over there. So um, it's great to be here. And of course, the other thing is, is Circle is a, is a product of the Boston Cambridge uh, FinTech Incubator. Uh, we were founded in Boston, uh, pr proud of that fact. And, um, and so it's great for me to be here with all of you today. So with that, we'll Let's go into it. the substance. Let's yes. do it. Um, so the, the panel before this um, was a really interesting conversation about ETFs and Bitcoin ETFs in particular. Um, we're gonna try to tie a little bit the ETF um, topic and theme with that of stable coins and the regulatory environment in general. Um, so Heath, maybe you could talk a little bit about how um, the ETF approval process um, is different from the stablecoin sort of regulatory world. Like, what's the difference? Like, ETFs needed to be approved by the SEC. Like, what's the story for stablecoins? Yeah, so an ETF is a pooled collective investment vehicle. They've been around for decades, and before them were mutual funds that have been around since you know the 1970s or so. Those are traditional investment vehicles governed by the securities laws, right? And so really what, what the ETF market, why it's so important that those ETFs got approved is that it basically merged the traditional finance system and means of investing in products that, that most Americans are familiar with and their financial advisors with the underlying, uh, underlying digital assets. And so the approval process for the ETF, while the regulators ask questions about the Bitcoin spot market, the Bitcoin future market tried to understand it. Ultimately, they were approving the issuance and offering and listing of a traditional security. It just so happens that the underlying assets of that pool of, of investments was Bitcoin. Bitcoin futures in one case, or two cases, Bitcoin 
uh, uh, spot, you know, the actual underlying Bitcoin in, in the case of the grayscale. Um, and so stable coins are, are not securities. We'll talk a little bit about that. But they are a digital asset in themselves. And our view, Circle's view, of, of what a stable coin is, is it's essentially a, uh, a substitute for money. It's essentially a dollar, in the case of USDC, on the blockchain, uh, blockchain technology. And so that's the whole point. It is a form of money. It is not a security. And so the approval process for stable coins has traditionally been, uh, we, we fit it under state money transmitter regula regulations. So these were laws that were set up in some cases, the 1970s, the 1980s. Um, and, and we are regulated under that regime. Again, it's not entirely fit for purpose, but the point is to make sure that if someone is transmitting money back and forth, uh, they, are, they are well regulated, they have enough money to back up the promises that they're making, um, and they're also applying AML, CTF, sort of all those rules. So it's, one is sort of treated as money, and the ETF sort of form of security, even though the underlying investment is not a security, in Bitcoin's case, but a commodity. I mean, I think this is a really important point that you're highlighting and um, explains a little bit why we as lawyers care, especially in the United States, I think, care so much about the characterization, the fundamental legal characterization of tokens, digital assets, cryptocurrencies, right? And I think a lot of the SEC discussion, or at least part of it, was like, what is Bitcoin? And why is it okay to have an ETF that holds a big slog of Bitcoin? Um, a related question that Heath is referring to is like, what are stable coins? We know they're not, we agree, they're not securities when well regulated, um, but what are they for purposes of US law? And I think you hinted that, at that a little bit. Yeah, already. so there's a lot of questions. And, and how many are familiar with kind of what's a security versus what's a commodity versus what's something else? Yeah, everyone, right? Everyone this knows is, Howey now. Yeah, everyone exactly. knows the Howey yeah. test, which again was the, the Supreme Court in the 1940s involving a Florida orange grove. We've basically imported that. We're trying to apply law that was made way back when. So people will ask me, well, look, you, you're, you're, you're a lawyer. How would, you, how would you explain it as simple as possible? What's the difference between a security, a commodity, and, and other things? And the way I would say it is, boiling it down to its essentials, first question is, is are you buying something, an asset, because you want to make some money off of that asset, right? In most cases, yes. Bitcoin, absolutely, right? Then the question, the next question is, is when you're buying that asset, are you expecting to make money based on the people, the enterprise that's backing that asset, the people that are involved, or is that asset valuable in and of itself? It has, it has unique value that's not determined by any one or person or group of people that are backing that asset, right? So if in fact you're investing in an enterprise and it's a group of people, let's say it's a project, some kind of, of, of DeFi or other project, it may very well be a security. Because if those people walked away, it would go down in value. But you take something else like Bitcoin, and there's nobody backing Bitcoin. It's out there, it's decentralized, and it's the supply and demand of Bitcoin in the world, uh, and, and it, it, that determines Bitcoin's value. Just like gold, just like corn, just like wheat, just like any other commodity. So that's the way I would approach it. Hopefully that makes sort of intuitive sense. We've confused things, we've, we've <laughs> mucked things up, but that's what Washington and lawyers do. But at bottom, that's what you're really getting at. Because in fact, if you're investing in an enterprise or a group of people, you need to know about those people. You need to know their plans. You need to understand what they're doing for that, for that business, and therefore you need disclosure. If you're investing in a commodity, you don't need to know anything about it other than in fact, it is genuinely that commodity. So then we get to something like stable coins and we apply that same test. But remember the first question that I asked was, are you investing to make money? Are you buying that asset to make money? In a case of a stable coin, that first question's answer is no, right? You're not buying, you, when you purchase USDC for a dollar, you can get USDC back, but it's gonna be a dollar. You're purchasing that because you need a dollar an internet-based, blockchain-usable uh, base layer of money so you can buy other things like Bitcoin and other assets. And so that's why I would distinguish it. So when you say, well, then, okay, uh, some, some digital assets, 
the, maybe some of these meme things are securities. Uh, Bitcoin is a commodity. Ether is a commodity. What is a stable coin? I would say it's, it's a digital form of money. So, it, so in, in Europe, in fact, they'll call it e-money. It's effectively a money, a money token. So those are the ways to think about the various types of financial of digital assets and where they may fall. Right, and once you've characterized the instrument that you're interested in, whether it's Bitcoin or a stable coin, right, um, that characterization results in the, the regulatory treatment of it. It funnels it right in, right? So if you've got a security, um, a token that's a security is subject to the full weight of our federal securities laws, um, but what, what regulates money issuance in the US. Like what regulations are stable coins and issuers like Circle subject to? So right now there is no federal regime, no federal law, unlike commodity futures, which is governed by the Commodity Exchange Act and the CFTC, the agency I was with uh, a while back, and the securities laws, which are governed by the SEC, there is no regime that, that prudentially regulates stable coins. There are things uh, that at a federal level, Instead, there's sort of a state law, a patchwork of state law that regulates money transmission. In some states, a license is required. In other states, it's not required. So you really have to look at basically the 50 states. There is, however, the, the, the Patriot Act, the Bank Secrecy Act, all the AML counterterrorism stuff. There is a federal regime for that that's run by FinCEN. But again, it's not a regulatory regime. It's more of a national security uh, or crime prevention pr regime. So that's where we are now. Right, and these are the same laws, for example, that have been governing money transmission activities in the United States for decades. This is the laws under which PayPal MoneyGram. and MoneyGram and Western Union operate. So that's right. sort of the framework that's been applied to stable coins um, so far. So what, what are, what's the future? What's the future for regulation of stable coins, do we need something different? I think we need a federal, the problem is this, is that, that we really do need a, a standardized federal regime so that if you think about it, a stable coin is something that is, you could even argue it's not even national, it's really international. It is traded over the internet, over public blockchains. So therefore, at the very least, a federal regulatory framework should apply. So when you, when you buy a dollar stable coin, you need to know like, this is actually going to be worth a dollar. There are regulations in place that require that issuer to have transparency, to provide liquidity, to have capital backing it. And for every dollar that, that is issued, there's, there's a dollar's worth of safe stuff that is put away for the benefit of the stablecoin holders that's backing that, right? And we see there's a number of stablecoins out there that, well, to be frank, like, are not stable, right? They're not either backed by the actual assets, the fiat, fiat denominated assets. In some cases they're algorithmic, but in other cases they're backed by a package of assets that may not ultimately be worth the dollar, right? And so, so we need the confidence because what we can't have is a situation where that fundamental base layer of Web3 transactions is in doubt, where people aren't sure whether they can actually use the dollar, right? That, ensuring that that base layer of money is well regulated, transparent, and people have confidence in it will allow all these other projects, many of which you guys are working on, to come to fruition. So that's why it's so important that we get that base layer right. So we'll come back a little bit to the uh, legislation and, and federal regulatory piece, but um, something that of course is very important to circle um, Maybe you could talk a little bit about why we need stable coins. I mean, we're all Bitcoin maxis here, I assume. But why do we, why do we need stable coins? What are, what, what's deficient in the payments world today or in the world today? Well, right now, Bitcoin, right, are quoted in dollars in, in, in most cases, particularly Bitcoin futures. And so if you want to buy digital assets like Bitcoin, like Ether, other things, you have to go through the traditional banking system and convert dollars and get them online and then be able to use them to get in and out. So we've got these off ramps that were built in the 1970s on and off ramps to the digital asset system. What we need is, is money, fiat money, that is native to the blockchain and digital asset world. And so that's sort of the real gap that I think Circle saw. We're not trying to replicate 
uh, Bitcoin, we're not trying to replicate Ether. In some ways, the product that we offer, our flagship product, USDC, is arguably the most boring product in all of crypto. But we would argue it's probably the most important, right? <laughs> because it enables you to keep your money in real dollars, effectively dollars, but, but on chain, in, the, on, in your wallet, so you can easily move in and out of the other assets that you want to invest in. Just to push on it a little bit, right? Yes. Because um, we all have privately issued digital money, right? Most of our money isn't paper cash, right? It is uh, commercial bank deposits. Um, what's the difference between a bank deposit and a in yeah, USDC. It's, it's, a, it's, it's the decentralized ledger, right? So, so yes, ultimately, you've got the centralized ledger, ledgers. And when you think about it, it's a great point. Because people are like, well, I don't know about stable coins. It's like private money. But guess what, folks? Of the $21 trillion that makes up M M1 and M2 in the US financial system, about 22 and M2, only a trillion of that, so 5%, is actually Fed money. The vast majority of our money supply are Citibank dollars, Bank of America dollars, all sorts of other digital dollars that are on these centralized ledgers. And so the difference between stablecoin and those are stable coins are actually on the decentralized ledgers, right? They're part of this new Web3 infrastructure. And the other thing I would say is that they're actually backed one for one by fiat money. They are sound in a way that, you know, the bank deposits, really what they're backed, what they're backed by is capital requirements, some reserves, and ultimately FDIC insurance for just a small portion of it, and access to the discount window at the Fed. So it is, one, one could argue that all things being equal, and that's why I think we've got to really be careful when we think about tokenized deposits as a form of new internet money is, um, it's not backed one for one, it's just taking the existing banking system, which only exists in its most stable form because of government intervention, and applying that to Web3. So I think my, our, my strong view and our thesis is, is that if we're gonna have the new internet money and we're gonna have dollar representations, it should be backed one for one. Yeah, I think another way to say that, and I know you've heard me say this before too, is um, I think a nice conceptual framing for stable coins is ideally they function as non-credit money, right? The way that a paper dollar bill or a $20 bill is non-credit money in the sense that if I give Heath a $20 bill, um, Heath doesn't have to do anything to settle that transaction on the back end, right? It's just the transfer of the actual note um, transfers the value. And stable coins work the same way, just like Bitcoin works that way, right? Once you've got a settled transaction in Bitcoin, everybody can go see that you have the transaction. Nothing else needs to happen on the back end. Now, if I pay Heath um, from my city account to his Wells Fargo account, sorry, I don't know, right? Like we can do an electronic transfer on Zelle, but then what has to happen in the back is the banks have to then transform my uh, deposit against Citi to his deposit against Wells Fargo in the back end um, because Citi dollars and Wells Fargo dollars are not fungible with each other. One is a credit against Citi, one is a credit against Wells Fargo, but stable coins are actual uh, bearer instruments where you can transfer value by virtue of moving them from one person to another. That is like a fundamentally different mechanic than commercial bank deposits. It's the difference between credit money and non-credit. That's right. It, the, the, the biggest difference is rather than having people in the back rooms of the large banks debiting and crediting their own centralized books, you actually have the movement of value over the on-chain. Yeah. Um, and the same would be true for deposit tokens, right? You yeah. can transfer those on-chain, but then you have to settle up off-chain behind the scenes. Um, so what about the third leg of the stool, right? We've got stable coins, we've got commercial bank deposits or tokenized deposits. What about CBDCs, like what's that? So CBDCs are very interesting. They are central bank digital currencies, right? And it doesn't exist in the United States, though there's been some really good and important and interesting work done actually here at MIT in conjunction with the Boston Fed to explore this. But apart from the technical issues involved, which we have experts here that can talk far better to those than I can, the concern about CBDCs in the United States is, is I'd say, goes really to the heart of what it means to be an American and democracy and civil liberties, right? There's a big concern. It's one thing to have paper money floating around uh, and, and have that be the Federal Reserve. It's quite another thing to have a digital bearer asset 
that the central bank is tracking at all times, <laughs> in all wallets, and in all purchases, right? And so we only have to look to China for the example of a CBDC, which in part, I think, is meant to advance um, national goals with respect to technology, but also in part to track uh, the social activities of the citizens. Uh, or at least many, many people would allege that that is the case. And even here in America, when you hear people say, well, yeah, but the government would never do that. I'm reminded of sort of, the, the, if the capability is there, the intention can change overnight. Remember the NSA, well, we would never spy. It's, yeah, it's technically possible to listen in on phone conversations between only Americans, but we would never do that. How many people agree with that, right? So, uh, you know, the concern is, is if there's a capability there, even if there's the best intentions, there's a lot of concern about civil liberties, right? And, and just the privacy issue of the government, uh, centralized government like the Fed, unelected, knowing what everyone is doing and potentially intervening in, in certain cases. In addition to that, there are questions about our entire banking sector. If ultimately the banks and other institutions are disintermediated and you just have everyone having a, an account at the Fed, what does that actually mean for credit and lending, right? Um, you know, what, what can you, do you go to the Fed ultimately to borrow money to pay your mortgage? I, I don't know, right? So there are a ton of unanswered questions. I think ultimately where this is going is, is I don't think you're gonna see a CBDC anytime soon out of the United States. I think uh, given the, the, the choices that we have between um, a, a Fed digital dollar, which again, I think many people have valid, very valid concerns about it, a tokenized deposit, it's basically taking our fractional reserve banking system and trying to put that on chain, as risky and unstable as that may be, and stable coins, it seems to me, and it, and it does appear to be growing consensus in Washington and elsewhere, that stable coins right now are the most logical path. I'm excited to see it. We yeah, I, I agree with you, Heath. I think, um, to be honest, despite like the vigorous CBDC discussion that seems to be happening in Washington, um, if I had to make a prediction, I think commercial banking kills CBDC because um, banks in the United States are very, very powerful and uh, CBDCs are potentially quite destabilizing to the entire commercial banking sector because they're safer money than commercial bank deposits. In times of stress, it's exceedingly cyclical um, to have a retail CBDC in existence. So I think uh, I agree with your prediction. And, 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 and the Fed is obviously one of the more competent agencies when it comes to operational <laughs> types issues. Uh, but you would be concerned, right? If, if, if the Fed wanted to double the money supply in the United States, it's hard to do that overnight, to do it quickly. They're open market operations. There's a number of things they'd have to jump through to do that today. But if they could literally hit a button and double the money supply and cause rampant inflation, even by accident, right? So you can see sort of the dangers, not to mention the cybersecurity issues of having a CBDC. I mean, the Fed is already probably a major target of state actors. Can you only imagine what it would be like if it had the ability to, to create currency, you know? Just like that. Exactly. All right, so let's uh, turn a bit. Um, ooh, lots of, everybody likes CBDC. <laughs> right. Um, okay, there, there, and then there. Yeah. The information and the panel. Um, uh, I, I think this is very clear that all these technologies, you know, are programmable, and I understand the CBDC's aspect of perhaps somebody like governor of Florida prohibiting CBDCs, right? <clears throat> Any state has its own stance, but is are you or Circle trying to be that digital dollar efficiently or in the long term? Are uh, it's are you guys trying to be the United States dollar, digital dollar at some point with? No, I think our goal is to help the U.S. dollar, not to not to replace it, but to be a, a digital uh, sort of version of that in the Web3 blockchain space. But we would envision a scenario where if the law is passed and everyone's held to the same standards, that there'd be many entrants in this market. There would be, provided every, everybody is set, held to the same prudential standards and, and you know, backing for the, for the asset, uh, as well as transparency, 
that, that we, wouldn't, we wouldn't be the only one in this market, but others would come into this market as well. But it would actually advance the dollar because without a CBDC and all the problems that comes with it, we do need dollars out there in the Web3 ecosystem. Uh, and stable coins, in my view, are the way to do it. But we're certainly not looking to replace the dollar. We would still have those dollars, the original dollars and treasuries and stuff backing uh, the USDC. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think you have to talk into the mic to be heard by the interweb people. Uh, hi. hi, thank you for the talk. So um, when SVV collapsed, uh, we have seen the value of USDCs shortly depeg de uh, before the federal regulators stepped in. So since USDC is international, what steps is Circle taking to help hedge against possible future instability in the US banking system? In particular, is Circle considering backing up USDC with a safe international asset like Bitcoin? Good question. Are we, are we, sorry, the last part. So, so it's really interesting. So let's go back. This was before I got there, but, but we had a situation in, uh, in February and March of 23 where, you know, you hear from Washington, oh, digital assets are bad for the banking system. It's going to hurt the banking system. But we actually saw the opposite occur early last year where it was the banking system that actually potentially jeopardized the digital asset system, right? And so, so one of the big, and so at, during that period, at no point, by the way, Circle always kept the peg. We, we, had, we always said, USDC is worth a dollar. If you are a Circle customer, you can redeem it for us for one dollar. But what happened was the banking system froze up during that, during that period, right? And so the on-ramps, the off-ramps that we discussed, they slowed down. And so it really showed the importance of regulation. Um, and, and, and ensuring that you know, there, were, there were places for, for stablecoin purchasers to put, uh, issuers to put their cash that were safe um, and the importance of the banking system in, in crypto. So then the next question was is, well, could you, back, um, could you back USDC rather than with a cash in a bank? Could you back it with Bitcoin? Uh, it's a great question. I think the answer is going to be no going forward because as, um, you know, as great of an investment as Bitcoin is, it is still fairly volatile. And so, so really, when, when, you, when, when, we're, when we're issuing, but that doesn't necessarily mean you can't have Bitcoin-backed assets that are, that are being issued. But ultimately, I think the regulators, and right now we're, we're governed by New York law in particular, is essentially cash and short-term treasuries. Uh, so, so I don't see us diversifying the holdings by backing USDC. I think USDC is always going to be backed by dollars and short-term safe dollar denominated assets. But your point is well taken that uh, under the current system, we are largely dependent on banks. And so if the banks are not stable, it will actually create issues in the stablecoin world and ultimately the digital assets world more generally. I mean, just talking a little bit theoretically, so mm -hmm. I know I'm the moderator, but I love this. Stuff. No, you're but an I, expert on these issues. The, so, so another way to think about this, right, is that the stablecoin issuer needs to have um, assets uh, to back uh, its obligation to redeem the stablecoin at all times, right? And that asset, the reserve assets are right now a mix of commercial bank deposits, which carry credit risk, as we've seen, um, U.S. treasuries, which don't have credit risk but have market risk. Um, and in theory, right, just like for banks that hold assets or make investments um, to back their obligations to depositors, stablecoin issuers need to hold those assets. If you add an asset like Bitcoin to the mix, of course, it's, it diversifies, which can be nice. Price go up, which is nice. But it also adds FS, FX risk and liquidity risk to the portfolio, which in turn would mean the issuer should, in theory, hold more assets against uh, its redemption obligation. So I think in theory, there's no reason why not, but I think there would be capital consequences to that if you're operating in a, maybe, maybe a little bit, maybe a lot, I don't know. But I think at the moment, and this is like a great segue, we'll get to your question as well, but um, a great segue to the next topic we'll talk about, which is actually what does stable coin legislation look like in the United States? And a big part of that is what can stable coin issuers hold against their redemption obligations? But first, let's the questions are very fun, so we should do them. Go ahead. Is 
So when I when I hit, I want to purchase one USDC, but I actually have to pay one point zero three dollars in fiat. So you were saying that um, if you want to purchase any stable coin, especially USDC, uh, you want one dollar in USDC, you'll get one dollar. But you, you weren't saying um, you're actually paying the gas fee, which is a transaction fee um, per transaction. So I'm curious about if you are kind of trying to. Um, it sounds like you're you're, bull, you're very bullish on, on stable coins. So per transaction, you're actually losing money. So the more you're buying, the more gas fee you're paying. So why do you consider it's very mature to purchase or store that many stable coins? Why you're paying that extra money? It's so sort of you're losing money essentially to have like the same kind of value in dollar amount. So um, compared to CBDC, um, my my understanding is more like it's kind of like just currency. It's like oh okay, yeah, it's like kind of like digitizing your dollar. So it's like your, your cash, like dollars and paper, now like the CDBC, so you're like, like just put it, like, just convert it like on, like on your on your phone. So so like why not um why why don't why don't you encourage people like um more and more people to purchase C D B C um like uh at the end of the day eventually potentially if they're if they're if it's possible if there's an option, but more so like stable coins where you have to still pay that money, like you're asking people to lose money like essentially. Yeah, so good question. Purchase a CBDC on your phone. You can't now, right? <laughs> so they don't exist. We, we, we honestly don't know um, what CBDCs will look like, whether they'll actually come to fruition. And then, of course, you're assuming that there's not going to be transactions costs involved with them. They may very well. So, so we don't know. We'll put those to the side. Very good question about stable coins. Um, right now, USDC, it sounds like it's, it's, there's the gas fees, and it sounds like it's also trading at a premium. Uh, that, that it's that it's trading a little bit more than a dollar. It may very well be because people are demanding more USDC for whatever reason at this point in time. Um, when you come to Circle, essentially, you 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 know Circle customers will will pay the dollar. They'll get the dollar back. There may be some kind of minting fee, but it's but it's really small. Over time, we would expect as this scales, because right now you're basically getting you're getting the use of a digital dollar that you didn't have before. So you have a utility there with that dollar. Even though you're paying a little bit, and there's the, you're, you're, you bring up a great point, you're getting utility that you didn't have when you had your dollar sitting in the bank. So that's essentially what you're paying for. But the goal would be that over time, um, not only because there's more stable coins out there, uh, and therefore the, 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 there's no sort of spread, the spread's narrow to something that's, that's relatively, that, that's, that's basically nil, and then obviously, too, with layer twos and all sorts of blockchain new technology, we're seeing gas fees hopefully reduce over time. It will become largely seamless. But that is the goal. Right now, we haven't scaled to the point where, where you know, you're able to sort of exchange things with, 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 with no value transferred or no, no additional value. But the hope would be one day that will be the case. But right now, you are getting a digital dollar you didn't have before. And that's sort of the value proposition. Okay, it sounds like USDC is the derivative of that, of dollars, not directly, if, if, uh, dollar equivalent. So just like, yeah, because I kind of like, I'm getting like fractional of the dollar that I'm paying because I have to pay more. Well, you're getting, you're, you're getting a digital version of the US dollar, and so that small amount is just to compensate for the smart contract technology that gets that. But the goal, ultimately, is that it, it, is, it is effectively the same as a dollar, but right now you can't use the dollar on the blockchain. So that, that would be the difference. All right, let's move uh, ourselves back to Washington, DC. Um, I live there. I know you don't anymore. but um, I'm glad I don't live yeah. there anymore, just to be. Yeah. Actually, it's OK. It's OK. Uh, uh, there's been a ton of discussion, and it's been um, quite active even in the last couple of months, last week, uh, on stablecoin legislation. I think, Heath, you've spoken a little bit about why we need it. Um, I agree. I think state-by-state -state legislation or regulation is a bit crazy when we have the internet, and when, even more when we have blockchains. Um, but you know, we're, I think, um, inching towards, maybe there'll be a leap in the near future, federal stablecoin legislation. Um, maybe you could give us, just at a high level, I know you guys aren't um, all lawyers like us, but a, a few of the sort of key aspects of stablecoin legislation and um, you know why it's good, good for stablecoin issuers. Yeah, so I think when you buy a stablecoin, you need to know that it's going to retain its value and that there's some there's stuff backing it that is that is legitimate and 
you know, largely the same thing that, that is denominated in the asset. So if it's a dollar, you should have a pool of safe liquid dollars or dollar denominated assets backing that up. So it can always be redeemed one, one for one, right? That, that's the ultimate goal. And right now there are no federal standards for that. So the first thing that this legislation would do would be to apply those, those standards. In addition to that, there would be capital requirements, there would be examinations to make sure the companies and issuing behind it are, are themselves stable, right? And they're not engaged in other sorts of potentially risky activities uh, that, 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 could, that could bring them down, right? Um, and then I think you'll also see the requirement that if you're issuing a stable coin uh, in the United States, that you, that you register with FinCEN and that for, for at least for your customers, uh, you were doing the AML uh, CTF, sort of the, the anti-money laundering counterterrorism uh, screening um, on your customers. So you're not actually helping you know, terrorist groups and, and criminals of, of that regard. So those are gonna be uh, sort of the key planks of any kind of stablecoin legislation. I think you're gonna see the ability of you to have a federal charter, a state charter, will continue to have kind of a dual system of federal and state, but the difference will be there will be uniform federal standards that sort of set a floor. I mean, this seems like a really good idea. What, what's the slowdown? What are the hurdles to this legislation passing? I mean, um, we were talking about the same exact thing in 2019 as part of the, the Libra project. Um, fast forward five years, like what's the slowdown? Uh, I don't, it used to be, I wasn't sure whether there was political will or bipartisan consensus. I think that's largely changed now. That's a difference between the Libra era and sort of where we are today. I think before people were like in Washington, uh, that stuff's weird, we don't understand it, therefore let's not do anything about it. I think now we're reaching the consensus that the technology is coming, whether Washington likes it or not. Uh, this is the story of that, right? Everybody in this room and your contributions to Bitcoin, at some point, Washington had to acknowledge the obvious, um, that, that, that this, this is a part of the future. It, it's the present and it's also a big part of the future. So regardless of what you do, these things are gonna develop. And so I think there's large bi bi bipartisan consensus, but what I would say is Washington is pretty dysfunctional. Um, and so I don't think it's gonna be an intentional uh, scuttling of the legislation. I think it's just gonna be that unfortunately we live in a, a world where there's political and other fragmentation. And so things aren't just, nothing's getting done. Right, and so you, we can't even pass a budget, uh, and so we're probably not going to visit things like stablecoin if we don't if we don't actually pay for the government first, right? So there's a constant. So that's my biggest concern. It's no longer that now there are groups that are dedicated to taking down. There are people out there in Congress. In fact, it it it, it pains me to say this uh, from a Boston-based company, but the Massachusetts delegation is probably one of the worst when it comes to being anti-crypto. There are some valid concerns, but I think there's just a sense, particularly from the far left and the democratic socialist, that you know, crypto is bad and has no good and redeeming qualities. There are a lot of problems in the crypto ecosystem, right? Not with Bitcoin, but with some of these other things, meme coin, other things that are around uh, that need to be addressed. But I do think there's this sort of reactionary group that doesn't want to see legislation at all, but I think they're in the minority at this point. So I'd say it's dysfunction more than anything else. I'm seeing hands go yeah, up at that comment. So, so there, and, and, and then don't feel like you have to ask a question. You can just give statements. <laughs> <laughs> I see um, you. One, we'll one quick note. First I, and then there. I think we have time for probably two more questions. Oh, okay. So great. Yeah, and I worked for two courts. I worked for the federal. In fact, I was a law clerk on the D.C. Circuit, which was the one that overturned the SEC's decision denying the grayscale ETF. I don't think that's not the function. The, the function of the courts is to keep the agencies in check to make sure they're doing their jobs. On paper. On, on paper. Yeah. But, but, and, and they have been doing it a little, and they have been doing it. But that's, that's not the solution here. We need, we need proactive, good government not the courts three years later to say you were bad government. So, I mean, yeah. I think there's also, oh, sorry, yeah. In the current environment as you are describing. Yeah, so I think there's gonna to continue to be this tension. We'll see what happens with the election. That will also be interesting. What I would say is 
How many in this room are registered US voters? Wow, it's, it's pretty much largely everybody, the majority. You guys have a voice. For a long time, that voice hasn't been heard, but there have been some recent movements where people have been coalescing. And I'll tell you something, people in Washington are noticing this. Yeah. People are changing their tune. We just saw the chairman of the banking committee come out and say, you know, look, he's, he's open to stable coin legislation, and it's good. And he's, he's, a, he's a very thoughtful, you know, sort of leader on financial regulatory issues who I think has been skeptical of digital assets. He is, he's sort of, you know, his views are evolving. I think part of that is because we've been doing a lot of educational efforts. I think part of it is, is the electorate wants these changes. And so I would, I would say to each and every one of you, you guys have a voice and I would encourage you to use it, particularly as we, as we enter this presidential election cycle. I would also make a distinction between different types of legal issues in crypto, right? Crypto is not monolithic. On um, the securities side, like stable coins, like despite every once in a while the SEC saying something weird, like USDC is not a security, like PayPal stablecoin is not a security, like that. There's no real contention about that anymore, and so there isn't really the same need for clarification in the courts as compared to other kinds of tokens where there really is a basic question about whether those things are securities or not. I we all have views about this, right? But there is that that's where you really need the courts to step in, where you have the SEC asserting jurisdiction because of the fundamental status of the token. Here, for stablecoins, actually, they're legal, right? Like they're, they're totally legal under existing law. The characterization is clear. The question now is, is the existing law under which they're regulated, that is state money transmission law, is sufficient? for this new form factor of them being on chain. Um, OK, wait. Enthusiastic questioner back there. Good. Yeah. Sorry, you're going to have to come to the mic. I don't, you can't, or yell. Or yell really yeah. loudly. Yeah. Uh, sorry. In most of the jurisdictions, uh, there are non-regulations uh, for the crypto asset uh, industry. So what kind of challenges the industry is uh, facing due to non-regulations and its impact on business? Wait, this is actually my next question for you. So. Who are the winners and losers if there is stablecoin legislation and if there isn't stablecoin legislation? So the winners, I think, are everyone in the digital asset ecosystem. So full on, I mean, and, and, and the reason I say that is not only will you have now more stablecoins, which again, I think will bring down transactions costs, you'll be able to trust the stablecoins, um, but it'll also serve as that base layer of money for the digital asset system and I think create the kind of legitimacy that we're seeing with the ETFs for more constructive legislation and work in this field. So in other words, I feel like stable coins are the most simple thing to get done first, and they can serve as the bedrock to move this industry forward. So everybody in this room, I think, wins there. Who else wins? Well, with stable coins, I think anybody, I see a lot of people who, 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 are, who are from another place and have family. How many people have family overseas and you send money back and forth? All right, another sh good show of hands, about 25% of the room. How many of you guys are tired of paying 7% or whatever to send your money? Yes, everyone. Uh, stable coins will, so will solve that problem because now you'll be able to send money from wallet to wallet seamlessly with, with virtually you know, no, no fees, right? You know, and so, so that's a huge thing. And then I think the entire financial system, as we move to maybe a Web3 version, the new internet financial system, uh, everyone that's waited five days for stuff to clear from the bank, you may no longer have to worry about that as well. So I think they're huge winners. Who are the losers? Um, I think the large centralized big banks and financial institutions that are adverse to change and want things to stay the way they are, they will lose, right? They can win if they pivot and they embrace the technology. Some of them are, but a lot of them aren't. Um, and then finally, I would say overseas and other actors that uh, have stable coins that don't comply with 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 sort of you know the the the, the prudential standards, the transparency, et cetera. I think unless they register, you're going to see money move out of those types of products and into safer, more regulated products. Okay, so we do a couple of weeks. We're done. We're done. We're done. All Sorry, right, everybody. Thank you, guys. Cheers.